and welcome to Art Alive. This week we're at the Blue Coat to present you three exhibitions that have been launched last week as part of the Liverpool International Photography Festival. Nitrate by Javier Ribas, Liverpool Photographs 1972-74 by Trisha Porter and Memorandum of Understanding by Tabitha Jusa. I'm joined with Marianne McQuay, who's the head of programs at the Blue Coat. Hello, Marianne. Hi. Uh, you are showcasing these three exhibitions. Can you present them briefly? Sure. Um, there are three exhibitions of photography. The first is by Trisha Porter, which is street photography from the 1970s. The second is by a Spanish artist called Xavier Ribas, and it charts the nitrate trade. And the third is by Liverpool-based artist Tabitha Jussa, which looks at the um, contrasting yet mirroring developments in Shanghai and Liverpool on the dock side. Okay. So how did you work on it? Why did you decide to, to showcase these exhibitions? In terms of having photography in the gallery, we wanted to time the exhibitions with the Look Festival that happens in May and which we're part of. Um, but more broadly than that, we were interested in a series of works that looks at the impact of economic change and economic change on communities, um, on housing, on development, and that economic change might come at a global scale or at a local scale. So that really runs through the three shows. They're very different approaches to photography, even though they're all documentary, but they do have a kind of, um, at their heart, a concern with kind of social and economic change. Okay. Um, these are not all by local artists. I think it's really important for arts organisations in the city to support artists from the region um, and the city. So Tabitha um, is someone who's kind of emerging at the moment and Trisha is someone who may have been in some ways overlooked, um, as in she was shown in the 70s but not since. At the same time, Liverpool thrives on new reference points and that's what we also seek to do. So in order to bring Xavier Ribas's show here, we made a partnership with MACBA in Barcelona um, and they kind of helped us develop the show and bring such a substantial body of work here. So we really try and bridge between different art worlds. Okay. Talking about Javier Ribas, this exhibition here at Nitrate, can you tell us a little bit what, what is it about? Nitrate has as its subject matter um, not just the mineral nitrate but the nitrate trade. So this was a trade that the um, British Empire um, traded in in the 1870s to 1920s and much of the wealth that you see um, in London in certain forms of architecture came out of this trade. Um, and it was also extracted from Chile, from the Atacama Desert, which you see depicted in the show, um, but without any return for the country. So it was essentially a colonial trade, and the artist is interested in putting the spotlight on something that's now a kind of overlooked, really, about the kind of wealth of this country coming from such a trade. Nitrate um, is used in fertilizer, so it's used to um, develop crops, so it's used to kind of generate life, you might say, but also it's used in explosives, um, so it can also be seen as kind of the end of life if it's used in warfare or terrorism. So he was interested in its dual purpose, and the trade declines at the point when nitrate can be made artificially, and it's no longer necessary to do this kind of um, very kind of dangerous and dirty sort of mining ex exercise. Um, um, the show takes you from the Atacama Desert in the 1870s where people were also observing the, the stars because it's also a place for astronomy. Um, it takes you through um, various sites in the UK and Liverpool and London were, were docking points for nitrate. This is another reason the show's here. And you see um, the stock exchange in London where it was traded, you see where sort of gentlemen collectors have their nitrate collection here and you're moving through locations and geographies but you're also moving through time so you're looking at different stories attached to nitrate. This is not something that is still do done today is it? No, the trade declined when it was possible to make nitrate and British um, 
colonies sort of sold off the nitrate trade to America. What's interesting about the site of the Atacama Desert, which is where nitrate was mined, is that after the nitrate trade declined, um, it then became a site where the dictator Pinochet, so the dictator that took over from the socialist um, governor in Chile, um, used it as a site for target practice and to disappear people, so to disappear the left wing. Um, now it's being sold as a huge tourist destination and like it's a natural wilderness when actually it's been carved through mining and then it has this other role um, it's a base for international observatories so it's still the place where it's um, most possible to see the stars most clearly and the artist was interested that actually Chile has always been subject to international interests and they've changed from a trade in mining to a trade in the stars you might say and so the landscape that you see has all of these histories inscribed onto it. Okay, I'm looking at the pictures and uh, they all look a bit similar in some ways. He wanted to have um, a very objective style of photography. So it's a really good point actually, because Trisha's, which Brian will talk about, are full of life and urgency and Tabitha's are very, very um, particular panoramic studies. Um, I guess Javier was looking at something you might call even more kind of forensic. So how what you're looking at might be seen as a form of evidence. So they're very, very beautifully lit, um, but they're very, they, they don't have people in them and they're very, very precisely shot because I think he sees them yeah, as a form of, you might say, evidence as much as a photograph. And the way you've set them up as well, uh, they're in frames, but when you look at all of them, it looks like the entire desert. <laughs> yeah, the, the work um, that if you come to the gallery, you'll see in Gallery 2, um, he's stitched together a landscape and it looks like initially it's a seamless shot of the Atacama Desert and then you realize it's different sections. But he wanted to give you a sense of its scale and of its, um, of its terrain, really. So this looks um, almost uh, like a very beautiful kind of drawing of the desert, I think. There's this exhibition, but I believe there's other events as well linked to that. Yeah, we thought um, the exhibition really needed events that expanded on its themes. So, for instance, on the 17th of May, there's a walk that starts in the blue coat that charts where nitrate would have docked in the city. So it's looking at the kind of um, manifestation of nitrate here. There are other events related to the all three exhibitions, looking at the ethics of portrait photography, um, looking at how we understand images in the 21st century beyond photographs. So we've created a series of events for each show, some of which overlap and look at photography as a medium. Thank you very much, Marian. Pleasure. We're now going to take a short break, but join us just after to find out more about the other exhibitions going on at the Blue Coat. Welcome back to Arts Alive, where this week we're at the Blue Coat for the launch of three exhibitions. And I'm joined with Brian Biggs, who's the artistic director of the Blue Coat. Hello, Brian. Hello there. Uh, we're in this room here where we got an exhibition by Trisha Porter, which is called Liverpool Photographs 1972-74. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, these are photographs uh, that are all taken um, in that period uh, in Liverpool 8. Now, that area is, is more popularly known as Toxteth, but certainly at that period, people who lived there would refer to it as Liverpool 8, which is the postal district. And Tricia was a young woman who was in, in Liverpool um, with her future husband, David Porter, who was a student at the university. And he was interested in the area and what was happening to it. It was a time of great change. Uh, the city was being, um, a lot of it was being demolished and new housing was going up, people, communities were being broken up. And this is a very multicultural, very mixed, old established community in the city. And he was going around and interviewing people and finding out about their stories. And uh, Trisha said, well, can I come along and take photographs? Because she was a, a, a sort of budding photographer. And that's how these photographs came about. So there's two series. There's the Bedford Street series. And that's based around Bedford Street, which is near uh, Myrtle Parade. Um, it's just where the university is, around that area. And she photographed other people that lived in that area and sort of found out about them. 
And that was successful. And then two years later, she focused on young people in the area. And that's the bulk of the exhibition here. It's called Some Liverpool Kids. And that was 1974. And she photographed these kids going about their daily business. And uh, she found they were a very energetic bunch of kids, as you'd imagine. At that time, there was a lot more life on the streets. Children played out a lot more. There was a lot of bomb sites left over from the war, which children turned into their own playgrounds. And so she got to know this group of children who said, well, come into our houses, meet our mums and dads, and uh, come and photograph us there. So what you've got here is this very intimate series of photographs of kids um, on the streets, in their homes, watching telly, uh, hanging out, um, watch, uh, having par parties after Liverpool won the FA Cup in 1974. And they're just, they're very vibrant. And what's great about showing them now, 40 years on, is they still strike a chord. We've had loads of visitors. Uh, lots of the people in the photographs have come forward and said, that's me and that's my sister and that's my dad and so on. So we're building up a sort of a, a sort of people's history of that area through the stories we're hearing and through these wonderful photographs which still look very fresh 40 years on. Can you tell us a little bit maybe about Trisha Porter and how she arrived in this area? I mean you've talked to us and tell yes. us that she, she met that boy? She met David. Da David Porter was the person that she was to marry. So she would be in her 20s when she came here. And she's from the south of England and she stayed here for about four years and then went back to the south of England. So it was quite a fleeting um, time in Liverpool. But she, this made a huge impression on her being in this, this area. She lived in Percy Street and then Huskisson Street, which are two very familiar streets if you know Liverpool Lake. Um, and um, the photographs that she's left behind have a real um, sense of understanding of the, of the people in the area. I mean, they're really sympathetic portraits. They're not like some um, street photographers, which um, I wouldn't say they exploit photo the people, but they, they tend to be quite intrusive. These are very affectionate. She got to know these kids, and they were her friends. Okay. Uh, you were saying that the exhibition is divided in two parts, and when you're mentioning yeah. uh, Liverpool 8, uh, there are two parts. Yeah, and it's become probably more pronounced, I think, with the sort of gentrification, if mm -hmm. you want to call it that, of, of a lot of those, the Georgian streets that were around there, they're very expensive now, you know, was at this time when she was photographing them, they were very poor conditions a lot of these buildings were in, and a lot of the area around uh, Windsor Street and the, uh, the other side of uh, Prince's Avenue has been demolished and changed, and it's quite difficult to, when you go around there now to see where some of these photographs were taken. In fact, um, Tricia went out last Saturday to photograph, uh, to re-photograph some of those places with some of the people that were involved in the original photographs. And we couldn't track everybody down, um, but the sons of some of the people who were in the photographs actually turned up. And so we've got, she's got a new set of photographs of the young people uh, in the same locations today. Is that exhibited as well in no, this exhibition? No, it's just she only did it them last week, and uh, it's free, it's free for a, for a, um, a, a newspaper article, which is which is hopefully going to appear quite soon. But it's been remarkable the number of people that have come forward. Um, we had some, one of the guys who's in two of the photographs, the famous the one we've used on the publicity of the football team. He's in that, and he identified the whole of the football team, so we know who they all are now. And of course, not everyone is with us. There's a few of the people in here have died and um, disappeared. Um, but quite a lot are coming forward, and it's brilliant. Um, that's, that's actually showing another history of Liverpool 8, because Toxteth has been going through such a change through these last 40 years. So, Yeah, many, many changes, and, and a lot of the people that are coming forward don't live in the area anymore, but some still do. And it's great to see that, that continuity and to hear these family histories of people that have been there for many, many years. Um, and it's a very mixed area and it's changing all the, all the time. And you can see in these, um, th these photographs the sort of very multicultural nature um, of a community. And you have to remember that this was before um, the so-called Toxteth riots, quite you know, nearly 10 years before. Uh, and it seems a very harmonious community and, um, and I think still is. And, and that's one of the great things about this exhibition. It just shows this sort of joy of living, if you like. Particularly if you're a young kid you know, running around that area at the time. It must have been brilliant. Playing these, these bomb sites, it's very sort of dangerous. You wouldn't do it now, but um, the things they got up to. <laughs> So there's the exhibition, but you're running also a couple of events, like the other one? Yeah, there's an event on the 18th of, uh, of June, which will be very interesting if, you're, if you live in this area now, because um, it's called L8 Revisited with Trisha Porter, and she's going to be here 
uh, talking to um, people from that area and we've got a whole bunch of people who've agreed to come down and just reminisce and talk about how it's changed and what they remember about it. So that's free and people can book for that um, anytime. So we're doing that event and there's another event uh, which is happening when Trish is going to be in conversation with another photographer um, who's got the show at the um, Museum of Liverpool called L8 Unseen which are photographs of the area today and people who live in the area um, in these different sort of settings and they're going to be in conversation talking about the ethics of taking these photographs because when Trisha was doing it in the early 70s you could do it, you could just take a photograph of a kid in the street whereas nowadays there's all sorts of issues around you, you, you uh, getting permission and the ethics of taking photographs um, it's a very different world and I think that's, that's again why these are interesting because there's a sort of innocence and a freshness about them which you find hard to do now even though we've all got mobile phones with cameras, we all do it, but actually to show those images and then to put them online, you get into all sorts of legal issues and so on. So the whole environment for taking for photographs has changed and um, that's one of the uh, conversations that we're going to be having with Tricia and that's on the 16th of May as part of the Look Festival and that will be, be here as well. Okay, great. Okay. We're looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now joined with the artist Tabitha Jusa, who's exhibiting her work Memorandum of Understanding. Hello Tabitha. Hello. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Um, it was, it's really come about from uh, winning the art prize, um, Liverpool Art Prize 2014 at Metal. And I was given the amazing opportunity to um, use the space. So um, I decided that it was time to bring out photographs that I'd made in Shanghai in 2012 and the way in which I could tie that in with Liverpool and it was very um, pertinent because obviously they're twinned with Liverpool um, and after some research I suddenly discovered there's a document um, called the Memorandum of Understanding which has been signed by both um, cities and it's kind of trying to kind of link culture, business, uh, the redevelopment of the areas, it was kind of an intriguing document. Um, so looking at ways in which Shanghai have been developing um, for quite some time and how they envisage their future development um, in contrast to Liverpool as well. Um, they're very, um, in, they have mass, mass population, obviously a lot, lot larger than, um, than the likes of Liverpool and what do you do with all these people who need um, accommodation so they're very good at building high-rises um, and so subsequently people from Liverpool City Council visited um, Shanghai and envisaged something very similar on the, the waterfront of Liverpool and it was quite it's quite interesting that that the Bund um, was built very much with the with the, the three graces in mind it's very very similar and it's quite strikingly actually strikingly so um, so then to have something that would then mirror both the Bund and also the, the new um, futuristic uh, skyline of Shanghai for Liverpool is sort of interesting. Um, so that the the uh, Victoria Clock Tower piece is, is about a piece of land that's owned by Peel Holdings and this vision for uh, the new Liverpool is also being proposed in that on that um, piece of land to also to mirror the, the Wirral Waters development. Um, so it's really sort of just questioning how we deal with, with pieces of architecture um, and how they relate to the past, how they kind of connect people together from different generations and is there worth in that? Is, there, is it worth protecting certain elements of our built environment um, so that people still have that connection? Uh, the futurist is under threat at the moment. Um, it's an amazing facade alone, but the whole history of people uh, reminiscing about their visits to the the, the, the cinema. Um, but it's in danger of becoming just um, another block of very inconsequential student flats. So surely there must be an interesting way of trying to preserve sort of remnants of, of the past that, that we can kind of, you know, still enjoy within the city. Um, and then subsequently, since the the, uh, I made the work on the Wolstenheim Square, then that was announced that the, the Casimir is going to close and that again is going to be up for redevelopment. It's, do, do we need them? I'm not sure. I mean, it's just a building after all, but 
it's a building with tremendous, um, it's, that's done a lot of good for the city from a cultural point of view and obviously it can move anywhere else but you know it's, it's, it's hope, hopefully sort of asking people to really consider the importance of, of what's around them because once it's gone, it, it's gone forever and there were certain things um, just by Edge Lane, which is by Metal, uh, the station. There was a row of um, coal merchant cottages, and it was really beautiful. I took a picture of it, thank goodness. Um, and then just coming out of Metal one day, it was suddenly gone, and that horrible gut-wrenching feel. It was really, it was a real emotional kind of, oh my God, it's gone. And so, you know, I just, I just hope people would really sort of if they felt that, that uh, passionate about things, just to kind of question it and fight, fight for it. What you're saying about the buildings and all the architecture, is it something that you saw in Shanghai as well? Because in Liverpool, I mean, there's like this mix, like you were saying, of uh, ancient buildings and new buildings. Is, is it the same in Shanghai? It is at the moment, but we went to the, um, the equivalent of the town hall. It's like the, the city planning um, department and it kind of mapped out. It's got this amazing scale model of Shanghai of the future. Um, and they envisage knocking down all all very sort of the older elements of the of the city in in, uh, in favor of the the sky rises, the, the, the skyscrapers and what have you. So incredibly futuristic. But um, Dr. Fay, who's going to be doing a talk um, on Wednesday, she she knows more about the, the policies in, in um, of the, the Chinese government. But basically, it's it's just a, it's charting the people's history, so it gives them that connection, and that's important. And it can also be quite profitable, really, if they think about it in a business point of view. Then you know, there's a tourist industry, and what they found now is. Unfortunately, they have knocked down a lot of the interesting Shikiman buildings, which are traditional um, housing, um, and they're actually rebuilding them. So they're, they're modern day versions just to kind of re replace them, what they have already lost. So hopefully they are taking stock and sort of like, OK, maybe we do need to hold on to a little bit more. So that's something that Liverpool should listen to as well. We, we've got the most listed buildings outside of in the UK outside of London, so we are actually quite good. But there's, there's, it goes up to a certain um, generation. So the exemplar of, of the city um, and its built environment. So it's things like the cultural elements. I mean, obviously we've already lost the, the Cavern Club, so we've just got to be careful. And yes, it's been rebuilt in a similar vein to, to what Shanghai are now doing, but. Wait, maybe we could just hold on to certain things in the first place rather than just rushing in and knocking it down. It's just it's just being conscious of of, of things and oh, so okay so Berlin they've got a really great way of just preserving certain aspects of, of old buildings. It might just be a wall, an internal wall, which still has wallpaper on it, but they've, they've encased it in so much and it's become part of the new build. So there are really interesting ways of tackling um, the new and the old and incorporating the both. And it's, it's you know, it's, you don't have to just knock it down completely. There are ways, there are creative ways in which you can tackle these, these problems. So. Thank you very much, Tabitha. Thank you. That's it for today in Arts Alive. See you next time.